Hi, everyone. My name is Kendra Seymour from Change the Air Foundation, and I want to welcome you to our mini class series on testing options for your home. This series is designed to give you the most important information on a specific test in an easy to understand way. Now, if you joined us last week, we talked all about air spore trap testing. And for today's talk, we're gonna talk about surface sampling. And I promise you, you're gonna wanna watch until the end because we're gonna show you some crazy pictures of things that maybe look like dirt or didn't look like that big of a problem. And when we tested them, it turned out to be a pretty big deal. So here's what you can expect though from each mini class. We're gonna break down the strengths and limitations of a specific test, how it should be used and how to read those test results and more. And I really wanna encourage you to head over to changetheairfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter by clicking that join community button because when this mini series of classes finishes, we're gonna be sending out a testing cheat sheet guide that is going to tell you everything you need to know about various kinds of testing so you can feel empowered when talking with professionals and making those choices for you and your loved ones. And the only way to get it is to sign up for the newsletter and trust me, it's gold. So that said, I wanna welcome back Mark Levy who's been taking us through these mini classes. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. Oh, uh, how you doing? Good, uh, good afternoon to you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, really excited about doing this again. Me too. I, I am pumped. Now, a surface sample is just is another common testing method that serves a specific purpose and can play an important role in understanding what might be going on in our home. So I'm going to let you just take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I did prepare some slides. So let me see if I can share that with us right here. And uh, let me go ahead and do that. And there we go. So can you see that pretty well? Yep. Excellent. Beautiful. Welcome to Testing 101, surface sampling. And today we're going to cover actually surface sampling. We're going to talk about how mold is inconspicuous. We're going to talk about the strengths of surface sampling and the limitations of surface sampling. We're also going to talk about when samples should be uh, sampled when you're doing surface samples. And then we're going to review some uh, photos and some labs of some, some different types of uh, situations that look suspect and maybe unusual that could or could not be a situation that you might think is really a problem. So what are surface samples? Well, surface samples are actually the collection of a limited surface area, typically one by one square inch of space. And there's three different types of common methods that are used. One is a tape lift, swab sample, and a bulk sample. Now I've put together a little quick uh, video to give you a little bit of an illustration of how this works. So let me go ahead and click this on and we'll be right back with you. Surface sampling is actually direct examination and the most common ways to go about doing collection for surface sampling or direct examination are the three that I have set up here. One is the swab, one is the tape lift, and then you have a bulk sample. Now let's go and look at the swab sample. The swab sample is in a tube and it has a little receptacle at the bottom, which is giving you a little bit of some moist liquid there. So it can make it easier for you to go to a certain area and then get a better lift. So this is what you would do in terms of going ahead and sampling an area that's suspect with a swab. It could be used on uh, dry material or wet material. That's one of the major benefits of using a swab. Then you also have the ability to do a tape lift. Now a tape lift is better when you have a substance that's in a dry area. You wanna be able to identify what that would be. So you would take this piece of tape here and you can see that there's a little square and you just place that right over the area that you want to uh, sample and then you lift it up. And then you have a um, slide that you would actually put this on right here. And then you would go ahead, close it up, identify the lab, location, and then you're ready to send that to the lab as well. And then you have the ability to actually take a bulk sample. And a bulk sample is pieces of different types of material. It could be drywall, it could be wood pieces, it could be uh, building paper, it could be wallpaper, anything that you can actually get a piece of that you can send to the lab where they can actually go ahead and uh, analyze it that way. So these are the three most common ways to do surface samples and hope this was helpful. Okay, so uh, that uh, kind of gives us a little bit of an illustration of the different types of uh, surface samples that uh, you can use. But before we go into more about surface sampling, I want to talk a little bit about mold itself and how inconspicuous mold is. 
In fact, mold is really microscopic. Most of the time, we're not going to see it, especially in its vegetative state. It's going to be something that's not even going to be clear to the naked eye. And most of the time, many people confuse it with like dust, but that dust could actually be a mold colony. And then it's the deception of the variation of color because it could be many different colors. Most of the time, people think that mold is either black or it could be gray, maybe even brown. But there's a variety of different colors that really make it very deceptive from, for example, purple to orange to pink to white. These are different types of color variations that actually grow based upon the type of mold that it is and maybe even the substrate that it's feeding off of. And then it's mostly hidden. In other words, you can't see it because it's behind the walls. It could have, for example, water stains on walls, and it could be behind the water stains. And wallpaper actually could be uh, hiding mold as well. So what are the strengths of surface sampling? Uh, surface sampling? Well, number one is the validation of the presence of mold. Number two, the quick turnaround time for analyzing these results and the cost-effective nature of it being really uh, inexpensive to get it done. It also helps identify when you do have mold contamination as far as source areas of where that mold is located. And it identifies viable and non-viable spores, meaning they're alive or they're dead. And it's very important to really be able to capture all the different types of molds, uh, molds what I call secondary byproducts from the spores to the fragments. And this is one of the things that it does. It could also be cultured if you wanted to culture it. In other words, if you wanted to determine molds and species, you can do that. However, it does have a, a longer time in terms of being able to process it, and it could be more costly as well. But another key uh, type of use for it is in post remediation verification testing. So when you're doing remediation, you're going to be able to make sure that you're testing the efficacy of the cleaning process in terms of the areas that they've cleaned. Now, there are some limitations, and those limitations, for, for example, you could overload the uh, sample because there could be certain debris that's around there, and that happens quite a bit with tape samples. It also happens uh, somewhat when you do have the uh, issue with uh, debris around areas that you're trying to sample. So you want to be very careful with that because the more debris, the more it's going to cloudy the way it could be seen in terms of uh, the mycologist being able to analyze it appropriately. And then it only does it to the genus level. So it's not giving you any kind of speciation whatsoever. So that creates a little bit of a problem because it doesn't distinguish between certain types of mold types. For example, Aspergillus penicillium, they look very similar underneath the microscope. And because of that, they have to pair them together and they call it Aspergillus penicillium-like. And then if you have high counts of hypho fragments, which is an indication of actual mold growth, it doesn't really distinguish between what mold it's coming from. So in other words, if you have co-occurrences of other different molds, and many times you will, you're not going to know if it's coming from the aspergillus in this particular case, or if it's coming from the cladosporium. So those are the areas that you want to keep in mind. The other thing too is, is that when you sample a limited surface area, what happens is, is that you may be missing out on certain types of molds that could be within that particular region. As I indicated earlier, co-occurrence of different types of molds are often uh, actually found. So you can have a myriad of different types of molds within the vicinity that you're actually collecting from. So when should you surface sample? There's a lot of people that are out there that will tell you, if you see it, you don't even need to uh, actually sample it. Well, we always recommend that you sample it because at the end of the day, what happens is, is that you're always going to get other people's opinions. And for example, I've been doing this for almost two decades. And I will tell you that if I can look at some mold, it's probably going to be mold, but I can guarantee you. Once I leave, somebody else comes in, they're going to tell you, you know what, that's not mold or that's not a big deal. All you really need to do is just wipe it down and let it go. And that's a common thing that you're going to hear from contractors and other types of handymen that are there. So at the end of the day, we always say you test, you never guess. And that's really important, especially when you uh, have health issues, because you really want to know what you're being exposed to. You want to know the kind of mold, and you also want to know exactly where that mold may be. And that the only way you're going to be able to do that is really validation through the testing. And surface samples really come in really handy because it really helps identify if there are different types of indicator molds that are there for water damage.
It also works extremely well when it's uh, when you're trying to establish certain types of remediation strategies. So you now you're getting a baseline. You're looking at the different types of molds that are there, and it helps you not only to have that baseline, but actually construct and really determine a proper remedial strategy moving forward. Post remediation verification is really critically important. Many people always put trust in the people that are doing the work. Some of them say, do I really need to go ahead and uh, test? You always, always inspect what you expect. And the way that you do that is through proper testing. And if you're doing proper testing, you're going to use in these types of situations, surface sampling to be able to make sure that the substrate that they've cleaned has actually been properly done. Legal cases all the time use uh, surface samples. They also use it in conjunction with other types of sampling methods to really build the story. And surface samples should only be should also be used with a myriad of other different types of samples. In other words, don't just use one sample to determine what's going on within your home. You really want to pair them up, whether it be with air samples, as well as uh, swabs or or uh, tape lips, uh, we talked about bulk samples, but the dispersion in terms of the byproducts, the secondary byproducts, in terms of the spores, the fragmentation and toxins, all of these become airborne, they impact the environment. You really want to create an entire picture. And we talked about how the co-occurrence of other molds can actually be there in water damage situations. The same thing holds true when you're dealing with what we call more progressive sampling to determine if there's been bacteria growth. And so actinomyces, as well as endotoxins, much, much uh, write-up has been done in terms of different types of studies about the co-occurrence of bacteria in water damaged buildings. So it's really important to be able to test that as well as maybe VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. Those cre are created in many types of water damage situations and even formaldehyde, which could actually be something that could be of a, of a major health consequence as well. So how do you read these lab reports? Well, Typically, what we do is that we want to identify and qualify that there is mold that's there. And what we're looking for, actually, is really indicator molds. And typically, that's aspergillus, it's going to be penicillium, cotonium, stachybotrys, eulocladium, fissarium. These are all high water content molds that are often actually there in water damage. So you can see, for example, in this particular illustration, I have aspergillus, I have cotonium, I have stachybotrys. These are all areas that are telling me that I got a particular problem when it comes to some type of water damage issue in and around the water heater that we tested. And we're also looking at your concentration levels as well. Now, concentration levels I have here to the, to the right, rare could be one to 10. Maybe that could be if there's certain molds like uh, various molds like alternaria or basidial spores or what have you, they could be normal trappings. Um, and same thing with low counts. But when you get into the medium to high, now you're looking to see at that point that these sources are certainly coming from within. And... It really doesn't matter. If you're picking up rare counts of a cotonium or stachybotrys, these are things that you want to pay close attention to because they're not going to be normal trappings. They're going to be indicative of areas of issues that are within the home or in the area that you're actually uh, sampling. The other thing that we look for is the concentration of these hyphal fragments because hyphal fragments are indicative of mold growth. So if you're picking up high counts of hyphal fragments, you just tapped into a, uh, a mold colony source that's there. And now you're actually really looking at an area that most likely has major problems behind it if it's just a, a small area that you've sampled. Now, you have gotta be very careful when you're looking at these samples because excess debris can actually be a, an inhibitor. In other words, it may make it difficult for the mycologist to read it, and he may have certain types of, of uh, registers of, of uh, counts that are there, but there's high degree of debris, which in essence is really overshadowing it and in indicating that there's more likely than not a bigger problem than what you're seeing on this lab report. And then bacteria, you can even know whether there's bacteria it doesn't tell you what type of bacteria, but as we mentioned, co-occurrences of bacteria is very likely, and you can see it within these lab reports as well. Oh, excuse me. So let's talk a little bit about 
some of the deception that we see. And these are going to be in some of the pictures that are going to be forthcoming as I move through the uh, presentation. But, you know, when is dust actually a mold colony? Well, to the eye, sometimes it becomes very difficult to determine that. And it can be very deceptive. Here, this is a master bedroom wall. And we're looking at this and you can see right here, looks like there's some dust that's on the baseboard and maybe a little bit of some dust that's on the wall itself. But when we actually tested it, it actually came back high counts of Aspergillus penicillium. And you can see the hypho fragments down here as well. So there's indication that there's mold growth that's on this wall. And you, at this point, when you look at these pictures, it doesn't really look like it's a big deal, but in actuality, it is. Here is another one where we're showing you an HVAC system. This one is uh, roof mounted. And some of these could be very problematic because a lot of times what happens is that you can get debris inside the system. As you can see, there's a lot of debris that's been actually accumulated inside the system, as well as here is the direct entrance into the living space from the flow of air that's coming here. So when we took a uh, sample of this particular area inside the air handling unit, you could see the elevated counts of uh, cladosporium. And what's interesting is that cladosporium is a very dominant mold when you're dealing with uh, air handling units. And most of the time under direct examination, you're going to have a more dominant mold that's there. But what we find is that most of the time, these dominant molds overshadow other co-occurrence of molds that are there, and you're not really able to see it. So this becomes a big problem in terms of really identifying that this isn't a source area. This is a mini split system. A lot of people have these systems that are there. When you look inside, you can see there's a lot of little speckles of things that are here. It could look like dirt or some dust that's just sticking to it. But when we actually sampled it again, you could see that there was high counts of cladosporium. And then what we know is that in this particular situation, that there was the issue of other mold issues that were actually in the vicinity of this air handling unit that was drawing it into the system, creating a problem. So in essence, you really want to understand that when you have a mold problem, especially when you're dealing with your HVAC system, a high percentage of the time, you're going to find that there's going to be a secondary source now in that system. So this is really interesting. When you're looking at your window sills or you're looking at your uh, window tracks, a lot of times you'll look and you'll see, wow, look at how dusty and dirty those look. But what we find, especially in homes that have mold problems, is that the majority of the time, that's mold. And you could see here that there is, uh, in this particular situation, we picked up some cladosporium. And there are a little bit of some co-occurrences of other types of molds that are there. But at the end of the day, what happens is that the, this is showing you that the mold is actually airborne and it's it's surfacing on here because it's actually landing from an airborne type of uh, movement. And we typically tell you that when you see this, it could be one of two things. It could be your uh, air hand, your air handling system is compromised or you could have maybe a more localized problem in this particular area. Another uh, great example is your refrigerator. The refrigerator is a huge receptacle of creating dust and accumulating dust. And what I mean by that, in this particular uh, unit here, if you took this panel off, you would see that there is a coil and there's also a motor. And that acts like a, uh, a suction. It actually is like a, it's pulling the air into that area and all this dust starts to accumulate. And there's a lot of moisture that gets built up in here because of the coil and the condensation that ends up there. So this can become a source area. And as it pulls it in, it's actually pushing it out. And what we're seeing here, this is the door seal or the gasket, as they call it. It looks like it's pretty dirty here. But when we actually sampled it, it came back high counts of aspergillus, came back high counts of uh, cladosporium. And again, this is telling us something's airborne and there could be a problem with your ventilation system or there could be something more localized in this area that you don't know about that's creating the growth of this secondary type of mold that you see here. Toilet tanks. 
notorious for uh, for mold growth. Why is that? Because when you flush the toilet, a surge of air goes into the tank and starts to create a little film or line lining around the top of this particular uh, tank, as well as the lid. And you can see here, the lid is really dirty here. Well, it looks like dirt, but when we tested it, it actually came back very high counts of cladosporium. And what we see many times is that there is a compromised ventilation system. And as we, we talked about in earlier uh, slides, high counts of cladosporium was actually coming from the ventilation system. So now that's pushing that out into the living space, becoming airborne and landing in these areas where it's susceptible for mold growth. This is really interesting. Uh, this is a uh, built-in coffee maker. So those of you that have built-in coffee makers, be very, very careful, especially if you, if you have a mold problem, because what you have to keep in mind is that there's a lot of water, a lot of moisture that's created here. And you have a lot of food source with the coffee grinds. And it's a well-known fact that coffee actually can grow mold. And you can see just a little bit right here, there's actually mold growth in these coffee grinds. So this system was actually compromised. You can see here, there was a high concentration of cladosporium, but again, when you're doing direct examination, you're looking at things that are going to be more dominant molds that are there. And we can tell you that there's a, a lot more co-occurrences, especially when you have moisture and so forth that's building up in there. So you can have other molds that you're not picking up, as well as bacteria that you're not picking up as well. So if you're drinking coffee and you're in a mold particular uh, building, be careful because you may be drinking moldy coffee. Here's another area where it's kind of deceiving because if you looked at this picture here, it really, from a vantage point, would really be nothing to the to your eye. It's really what we did is through the investigation process, we noticed on the exterior of the home, there was actually water that was actually flowing towards the building from a sprinkler. And because of that, we told them to really remove the baseboards for further investigation. And when they did that, we noticed there was some rusty nails. There was a little bit of some dark substance that was here. But when we tested it, it came back high counts of stachybotrys. So it's indicating that there's obviously a major problem that's going on in that particular area. Here's a real big uh, area that I think is one that's often overlooked. And this is Typically, uh, in a garage area, you'll see many times that you're going to have your water heater and your HVAC system co-located together, and they're sitting on some type of platform. But keep in mind, this platform is actually used as the plenum, which is the, um, the highway, we'll call it, for the return of your air from the home to come back into the system and then be actually uh, driven into the system and then condition and then resent back out to the uh, to the living space. And you could clearly see here, there's been some patchwork going on. Looks like there's been some water damage, although everything was dry. It wasn't really something that was wet at the time. And the client felt, look, it's just, you know, it was water, it was dry. It doesn't appear to be a problem. Well, when we actually sampled it, it came back with actually some big problematic type molds. There was Aspergillus penicillium, there was Cotonium, and there was Stachybotrys. All of these molds have the ability to produce potent mycotoxins. And so when you're dealing with your air system, anything that's in this area, is gonna get actually pulled into the system and be redistributed back into your living space because the air system is the lungs of your home. Here's another example of the uh, HVAC system. You can see here, uh, there's the plenum that's there. All this air is moving in and then coming back up. When we took off the panels here, you, a, you have a very clear shot of the inside of the plenum. And this is what we call an open system. In other words, it's not a direct metal connection. It's really directing the airflow through the interstitial space or wall cavities in this particular type of uh, built uh, scenario. And so when the air comes in, it's pulling from all the different types of contaminants that are here back up into your, uh, into your system over here. So when we look closer, we saw that there was some water damage here and a little bit of some suspect uh, mold growth that was there. And sure enough, came back 
stachybotrys, as well as aspergillus. So now you're seeing all of this uh, type of water damage and mold that's being pulled into the system and actually being redistributed throughout your home. High relative humidity. Yeah, mold can grow, not just in liquid form, but also high relative humidity. Here's a great example. This is a kitchen cabinet. We did a tape lift on this one. And we opened up the cabinet and there was this like white film that was there. Now, many people would look at that and they say, wow, that kind of looks like dust to me, or it doesn't look to be too much of a big deal. And that's why I say mold is very deceptive because of the color variations that are there. But when we sampled it, look at this, high counts of aspergillus penicillium, some high counts of cladosporium, major high counts of hyphal fragments. So we obviously have a problem that's there. And then another area that is very deceiving, People, more so today, wallpaper is extremely popular. Aesthetically, it's really nice looking. It's really pretty. And uh, it's something that people like to do. But it could be really problematic, especially on exterior facing walls or walls that are actually common to bathrooms and so forth, because wallpaper acts as a vapor barrier. It can trap moisture. Moisture diffuses through building material. So if it's not able to make its way through here, what happens is that as we pulled back the wallpaper here, you can clearly see that there's some mold that's there. Look at the mold that's growing on the wall. And when we took the sample of it, stachybotrys came up as well as aspergillus penicillium. And the client had no idea because they couldn't visibly see, visibly see that there was a problem because it was being hidden by the wallpaper that was there. And she was actually really sick. And this was something that was a really good find. But unfortunately um, for her, she's going to have to obviously remove the wallpaper and do further steps of reme remediation there. So when you're dealing with attics, many times we'll go into an attic and we'll see that there's a wood framing that's there and it has this like dark substance that's on it. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. Most of the time, whether it's your contractor or whether it's even a builder, they're gonna tell you, you know what, that's no big deal. All it is, is a wood fungus and it's not gonna cause you any kind of harm. But you never know until you test. And we always say, don't guess, test. And so here is a great example of this because when we tested it, it came back. Aspergillus penicillin. And most of the time when we test these types of uh, wood framing in your attic, it's coming back with other uh, types of molds, not the wood fungus that people are telling you about. And when you're building a home, wow, this is, you know, people say, well, maybe I should go and, and buy a new home and build a home. And, you know, that's a better way for me to not deal with other problems that I've been dealing with, with the years of problems, in these homes that we've been living with. But in this particular situation, you want to be really careful about the way that the framing is being stored and maintained. Because what happens is that whether it comes from the uh, lumber yard or it could happen even at the property, if it's not under proper conditions in terms of being stored properly, you could actually have mold that can start to grow. And so you can see here that there's sus suspect mold that's here. And I will tell you that the client that we're dealing with, they were very much aware of this as being an issue. And they even told the, um, the contractor not to put up any type of moldy mold, and moldy wood rather. And when they came back the next day, all this wood was put up and it had mold all over it. So they were really upset. And uh, we were brought in to do some sampling. And sure enough, when we sampled it, because they said it wasn't a big deal, it's just a wood fungus, it came back. Aspergillus, cladosporium, and it, it's not the wood fungus that these guys are thinking about, right? So you really want to be very, very cognizant of the fact, how's that wood being treated? How's it being maintained? And really being on top of it, especially if you're looking to build your own home. And that's really all I have for you today. I hope that was helpful, giving you a whole different type of variations of where mold could be harboring, where it could be kind of deceptive. And uh, the reason for sampling is really extremely important because you really want to make sure that you're not guessing. You're really doing a very good job of proper due diligence. And this is one of the ways that you can do that. So, Kendra, thank you for letting us be part of uh, the presentation today.
Thank you so much. That was incredibly eye-opening. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people whose landlord or maybe their spouse or contractor said, you know what, it's just a little dirt. It doesn't look that bad. Um, surface sampling is really not all that expensive and it can give you some pretty important information, especially those those um, examples where there was crazy amounts of stacky batteries. Like I, I couldn't believe it. It's crazy, right? You just don't know. And uh, like I said, mold is really deceiving and it's very inconspicuous. And you have to really do a deep dive when you're really dealing with water damage and never, ever take anybody's opinion that it's not a big deal when you don't know until you really get into doing proper testing. Well, thank you again. And for everyone listening, if you enjoyed this, do us a favor, like, follow, and share us on Facebook and Instagram. If you haven't already, head over to changetheairfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter. And don't forget to join us next week where we're going to keep talking with Mark about testing options for your home. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.